My name is Carrie Hyde. I am your pet's life coach, and I'm also an admin for saving pets one pet at a time. So I kind of talk about both as, as we merge these together, and uh, mostly because my time is, you know, spent most of my time is spent at the spa doing um, therapy baths for dogs. And I absolutely love, 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 love what I do, which is usually why you guys get me in a ponytail and I rush in and do that. So I just want to welcome both groups, uh, Saving Pets One Pet at a Time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A lot of times we have... Um, we have uh, some of the other moderators with me. So I just want to remind you guys that for some reason on my stuff, it only comes up Facebook uh, user. So please put your name in there. I think it's because we had to merge some stuff together. And for some reason, it doesn't tell me your name. Uh, and I need to know if some of my fellow moderators are with me from Saving Pets One Pen at a Time. And then if you're listening from the spas page, welcome, welcome, guys. I'm super excited. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about because it's something that I do deal with a lot. I know it seems so trivia, trivial to people. Uh, oh, it's just some tear stains. And a lot of my clients even say that to me. Oh, it's just superficial. I don't really care. It's no big deal. And um, even sometimes veterinarians will say that, oh, it's just, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Um, but we're going to talk tonight about tear stains, uh, which is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, you probably got from that little point right there um, that I don't think that it's just superficial and nothing to worry about. So we're going to talk a lot about tear stains today. And uh, I just bought new glasses and I think they're the wrong prescription. Um, Lori's letting me know. So I keep on going like this because I can't see. Hi, D. How are you? Uh, I got to get my other glasses. Maybe my husband can hear me and bring me my other glasses. <laughs> He's in class right now. So if you see me keep kind of going in, I think I got the wrong, um, you know, for any of you guys that are in your 50s. Uh, you go and get these little readers and I think I just got the wrong whatever number on it. I think I got 400 and now it's all blurry. So uh, anyway, so I welcome, welcome you guys so much. I hope that this is going to show up as being um, something very valuable to you and that you can um, find some solutions to that because it is something that that people see. And I do agree. It can be embarrassing, especially, uh, you know what I find, what, what I find when people who are the most embarrassed about their dogs having tear stains. Uh, and you, I bet you guys could even guess the group of people who are the most embarrassed if their dogs have tear stains, uh, put it in the comments. If you can imagine who that might be, um, they are the same group of people. He's so nice. Thank you. I might be able to see now guys. Thanks. Ah, oh, that's so much better. So uh, it's the same group of people who are embarrassed, sadly, if their um, dogs get cancer. It's the same group of people that are embarrassed if their dogs have tear stains. So if you can imagine who that is, not the breed, the group of people. So if we were to, uh, yes, D, absolutely. Can you believe it? Raw feeders are the most embarrassed if their dogs get cancer and the most embarrassed if their dogs have tear stains. Um, and the reason for that is because we spend a great deal of time. I'm a raw feeder. Um, uh, I'm a, well, I am a raw feeder, but I am a supporter of a species appropriate diet, whether that be, um, and that's more about what's in it, not whether it's cooked or not cooked. But the reason why um, raw feeders become very embarrassed if their dogs get cancer or very embarrassed if their dogs have tear stains or if their dogs have any health problem at all is because we spend, and sometimes people spend a really great deal of time um, arguing that uh, a species appropriate diet or a raw diet is, is the miracle of all miracles and solves all problems and all of those things. And so then when one of our animals gets sick or shows tear stains, we, you know, some people will actually hide it. Uh, I am fortunate enough right now that I don't have any of those animals, but I will guarantee you um, that if that starts to happen, although my, my um, little guy right now gets a bunch of like uh, gross stainy stuff around his mouth that I'm still trying to figure out what the cause of that is. And I think it's my pond because he keeps putting his face in, in my pond. Uh, but I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. But yes, we get embarrassed. And, and, and that's because we don't realize that there are so many elements that we can't control. There's so, so many elements that we can't control. So a lot of times I tell raw feeders, um, and we'll talk specifically about tear stains in a minute, but I tell raw feeders all the time, you're not realizing that had you not been feeding your dog 
that diet, how much worse your pet's life might have been, right? They may not have lived as long. They may have been diagnosed with cancer sooner. Uh, there's so many factors. So if you are a raw feeder and you end up with an animal who is sick, please don't be afraid to communicate it because, because we, you, you, we can't just hide it under the rug and just be like, oh, it doesn't happen. I, I used to own a nutrition store that was just a nutrition store. The one I own now has uh, boarding and daycare and grooming and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, I'm an esthetician and I spend an enormous amount of time dealing with the skin's microbiome. And that's my favorite, favorite, favorite part. Um, but when I used to own the nutrition store, uh, people would come in all the time and just be like, you said that my dog wouldn't get cancer if he ate a species appropriate diet. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I never said that. <laughs> never said that. Certain breeds, coats, uh, saliva tear interactions. So, um, so we're going to dive into this. We're going to talk about tear stains. Uh, don't be embarrassed. Although I do know it can be, you know, a little embarrassing, especially if you're a raw feeder. So we're going to talk about, uh, all of the different things that can be causing, that for your dog, uh, the tear staining, but we're also going to be talking about just staining in general, right? So when your dog is licking their feet, sometimes they leave, um, brown marks on their feet. Uh, sometimes around their rectum, you'll see, uh, a rust color. Sometimes if you have a male dog and he's urinating, you're going to see it on his little spout. Uh, female dogs will get it around their little vulva. So it can really be anywhere. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. So but let's specifically talk about one of the things that uh, Arlene is saying. She says, I thought it was due to certain breeds, coat and saliva tear interactions. So um, it is definitely, definitely not a breed specific thing. Definitely not. I see probably, oh God, today I think I bathed 30 some odd dogs. And you can, I, you can have um, tear staining on French bulldogs. You can have tear staining on, on the Maltese, which is very common. You see it a lot, but mostly it's because it shows up on them. Uh, I've seen it on black dogs, but you don't really notice it unless you know what you're looking for. I've seen it on every single breed that is out there. Uh, and, and that's because there's so many different causes of it. So it wouldn't be a breed specific thing. Now, Dogs who have those little smushed faces like the bulldog, uh, it allows for it to grow easier uh, and get in there because of, and that's one of the things we want to talk about is the anatomy of your dog. So the little shelf, so to speak, if you can talk, think about the shelf, the way that their, their cheekbone comes out. And so when the tears come down, it can kind of sit there instead of draining all of the way. Um, so sometimes, yeah, the anatomy of your dog, which would also lead to the breed. Um, but that could be, you know, one breed the, you know, you can get two dogs from the same family and their, their makeup of their bone structure in their face is still going to be different, even if they're both Shih Tzus. Um, some might have a more smushed nose and some might not. So, so let's talk about, I think the environment over vaccinated cancer. I fed mine raw. She had lymphoma aggressive. Oh, damn it. Lymphoma. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that because so many, yeah. And a raw fed dog. And I just, I tell people all the time, listen, it, had your dog not been a raw fed dog, God only knows how long, I don't know how old she was uh, or who's even talking, make sure, especially if you guys are admins uh, for Saving Pets One Pet at a Time, because I really want people to get to know um, on Saving Pets One Pet at a Time, there are 27 of us and I'm trying to coax one more in with us and she happens to be here tonight and I'm trying to get her on, uh, but I'm not going to call her out yet. Um, but I do want you guys to know that there are 27 of us uh, that are involved and we all have different expertise. So sometimes you'll see us tag each other when we think, oh, someone else, she's, she's nine years old. That's young. That is really young, especially now that we are looking at the fact that we have a 31 year old dog on this earth right now. We're super excited. If you don't follow Dr. Karen Becker, uh, I would encourage you to, because she just got to fly out there and see this 31 year old dog. I'm a little jealous. So, all right, let's dive into this. So we know that it is not breed specific. It is not age specific. It is not female. It is not male. Okay. So any of those that you've heard, I can guarantee you is not, I know I saw Arlene. I just, and now you just gave yourself away. Um, so it's not breed specific. It's not age specific. It's nothing. I've seen puppies. I've seen seniors. I've seen it go away. And that's the thing I also want you to know is it can be maintained and should be maintained depending on what the cause is. But no matter what the cause is, um, they all lead back, I think, to what could potentially be harmful for your pet. 
Cocker Spaniel, age four. He sometimes has eye drainage from his eye that is clear and black at times. Uh, one eye or both eyes? So, okay, so let's talk about some of the causes, right? We have to talk about possibility of allergies because allergies can make their ear, their their eyes tear a little bit more than normal. And so they could be tearing, tearing, tearing. And then sometimes those tears, depending on the way that the bone structure is, both eyes. Okay. Um, he's four. I drainage from his eye that is clear and black. Black at times. That's interesting. Um, so if the tear ducts, if the tears are sitting on that little eye, sometimes bacteria or yeast can grow because it's a very moist part. But here's the thing. If your dog has a balance in their body, and you know you've heard me say this a million times, uh, if you, hi Lily, Lori's on the background telling me who you guys are because I don't know and I wanna address you guys. Hi Lily, uh, with the cocker. I wish it doesn't, it just says Facebook user. If you're coming from Saving Pets One Pet at a Time, it says Facebook user. If you're coming from the spa, it says the name. So, um, okay, so I don't want to get off track because I want to make sure I get all of these for you guys because tear staining, I think, is really important, right? So we know that if the tears are draining and then we're allowing yeast and bacteria to grow there, it's because your dog's already imbalanced because that's why there's extra yeast and extra bacteria in the body. And keep in mind, it's not a good idea to try to get rid of all the yeast in your dog's body. It's really, you, you need to have a very level balance, which is really the frustrating part, right? Because we just keep throwing bacteria at these dogs and all these different kinds of probiotics. And, and hopefully we're learning to do some prebiotics. And if you ever listen to Julianne Lee, she talks a lot about postbiotics, which is amazing to listen to and understand that. That's kind of something a lot of people don't hear too much about yet, but it's a lot coming on. So we, we know that if it's structurally the problem that we're just having these tears there, then we absolutely have to uh, get that balance in there. But how are you going to know it's balanced? That's the tricky part. And so in that case, I always recommend running an animal biome test so that you can see where your dog's balance is. So you make sure you have the right amount of yeast, the right amount of bacteria in the body. Um, because if, if you did, then it wouldn't matter what was going on because dogs tear, all dogs tear. We tear, every, all, humans, mammals. I, well, I, I, I think all mammals. I don't know all mammals. <laughs> I don't know about all mammals, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of them are constantly doing uh, tearing. So if it were just caused solely by the tears, then every dog would have tear stains. And we know that that's not the truth. So we're trying to figure out what it is. And um, so I'm going to mention a couple of things to you guys to keep in, in, um, in line. Uh, one of those are, is that sometimes the tear ducts can be clogged. And there's two ways you can handle that situation. And the first way I would do without a doubt right off the bat, which is just take a warm washcloth and then your dog's tears um, all along the rim of his eyes. And then the duck where it actually is supposed to drain back in is in the center is in, you know, like ours, it's, a, it's there. And that's where it's supposed to drain back in. But the tears actually form along the eyelids. So you wanna just kind of rub all of it and then rub in between the eye with a little warm washcloth. Uh, you probably wanna try that for a good two weeks and you wanna at least do it once or twice a day. If you can do it twice a day, it's great. Just get in front of the TV and get a little warm compress little thing and just kind of rub the tear ducts to see if possibly um, that will help. You can also get uh, chamomile tea standard and for some reason she tears from one eye. So see, that's why I ask one eye or two eyes, because if it's one eye, there's a very, very good chance that the tear duct is, is clogged. Um, both tear ducts can get clogged, but generally when it's a tear duct issue, it's one eye. Um, and that, please, please, please do not, you know, well, she said it was only, it's only the tear duct if it's one eye. It can be both. But generally speaking, when I see it being one eye, it's either caused by something wrong with the eye, which you need to have your vet look at to make sure that there's nothing, no scratches in the eye, no infection in that one eye, those things. Um, and if that gets all cleared, then there's a really good chance that you might have a clogged tear duct. So warm compress, just kind of rub it on the, the and you, you need to do it for about a week before you're going to know. It's not going to just unclog magically. You want it to be warm. 
and steam helps open up things. So sometimes, you know, you don't want to burn your dog's eye, but sometimes if you just take the steam and kind of hold it and let it steam up into the eye, sometimes that will open up the tear duct and allow for it to kind of go on its own. Uh, but you got to be careful. Don't burn your dog's eye with steam. Just make sure that it's just kind of a warm tear duct. The other thing you could do uh, is you can take, um, I'm not familiar with that, but I love Dr. Connor. So I'm going to say, go with what he says because he's amazing. Uh, but one of the things you could do too is chamomile tea. Chamomile tea is pretty amazing. You just want to make sure it's organic, make sure it doesn't have anything else in it. And you can make just a regular, like you would a tea, and then you get like a cotton ball and then you drench the cotton ball in the tea. Make sure there's no leaves or anything else that can get stuck in your dog's eye. And then you just want to absorb as much as you can and then hold it over your dog's eye and drip it into your dog's eye. Chamomile helps get rid of inflammation. So if there's just a little bit of inflammation that's causing more tears to produce, sometimes that can help. So those are those are kind of some tricks that I use for hoping that if it's a clogged tear duct and it doesn't get clogged again, you're great, then solution solved. But there's so many other causes of uh, tear stains. And so they're important, right? A clogged tear duct is not, that's not good. So when vets say, oh, it's just tear staining, I always get a little bit upset because I don't think that's fair. We wouldn't accept that for ourselves. Oh, it's just no big deal. I just tear constantly. Um, so uh, that's one thing you could do for that, but let's talk about other things and some of the things, and you should really, really, before you just start jumping in, especially with the eye guys, before I get going too far into this, y'all know I'm not a vet. Um, but also know that it would be a really good idea to make sure that your vet has ruled out anything serious, right? Because sometimes you could have um, the pressure in your dog's eye could be really big and that could be causing extra tears. So you want to make sure that your vet checks their pressure, checks for glaucoma, checks for anything serious. And I don't care how old your dog is. A puppy can have um, really severe eye injuries and things that are going on in there. So you want to make sure your vet does a thorough exam on your dog's eyes before you start anything that I am telling you might actually be a problem. Please. It's really important. You don't want your dog to go blind. Trust me. It's not going to be, I see, I have a blind dog staying with me right now and it's just awful. It changes everything for them. Um, okay. So we got that out of the way. Make sure you guys get a clear, you know, like your vet can't find anything wrong. And then you can start kind of on your own diving in and trying to figure out what it could be. Of course, if it's allergens, you want to make sure that you're removing everything from the house. Maybe do an allergy test. Uh, that might help you. Uh, not always. Some of those allergy tests just, I, I love, there's there's NutriScan I love and I love five strands are both really good that I've got good results from. Uh, and that might help you if you just kind of remove some of that stuff. So Okay, so let's look at, keep in mind too, you can have inverted eyelashes that can be causing your dog to, to blink more and tear more. So this is why I want you to go to the vet to see if the vet can check and see if there is um, any kind of an inverted eyelash that could be causing some problems. In the bright sunshine, do dogs need to wear sunglasses? Um, I would have your dog checked by your vet. Absolutely. If your dog is having some some sensitivity to sunlight. Like we all have a little bit, but if it's enough that you're really, I mean, that's pretty common. My dogs will do it right when they first go outside. I notice a little bit of a squint and then they adjust. Uh, but I, I, good luck. I don't know if you could get your dog to wear sunglasses, but I it certainly don't think it would hurt them so long as they don't mind wearing them. Uh, so have your dog, your vet check to see if there's an inverted eyelash that could be causing an extra blinking. That's real. That is more that's kind of a breed specific thing. I know any dog could have an inverted eyelashes, but we do really, really, really see it a lot in the Shih Tzu. So, but I've seen it in bulldogs. There's certain dogs that, that can have that problem. You want to rule that out. You got to rule this stuff out because you could be over there rubbing a washcloth and putting chamomile tea in your dog's eye for two weeks. And the whole time you've got an inverted eyelash. So yeah. So sometimes you can have one that is just poking at the eye. It just went the wrong way. And it's like a ingrown toenail kind of thing. And it just causes this constant blinking, blinking, blinking. So you've got to make sure though, not every vet is the eye expert guys. I got news for you. Sometimes it's really hard. Vets have to learn so much 
really think about it. I mean, they are learning everything and not just one species, two species. So they have to learn two species, unlike human doctors who just learn human. Sure, there's male and female, but we've got male, female cat, male, female dog. So when you're going to a doctor or veterinarian to have them look at your dog's eye, ask them to be honest with you. Are they, I I just had a a client. I am so in love with this veterinarian and you're going to be shocked right now because he's not holistic, but I got to tell you, I am so big on integrity that it means so much to me when someone can say, Hey, I don't know. And she had been going to him for a long time and then came to me as a nutrition consult. And I, right away, I was so sure this dog had Jardia and she took him back to the vet and had, it was a year, a little over a year and a half that she was struggling with IBD with this dog, which turned out to be Jardia. But when she went back and he ran the test and it came back positive, and then I gave her suggestions to do for it, she asked him and he said, you know, I got to be honest with you. I am not a GI guy. I just, I just am not a GI guy. Clearly I'm not a GI guy. I didn't even think to run for Jardia. So make sure guys, your dog's eyes are so important. Make sure that your veterinarian, no matter how much you love them, they could be so great at one thing and just not that interested in the other thing. I mean, I work with animals and my biggest interest is nutrition and skin, but everything else, it's not that I'm not interested in it. It's just that it's, I spend the majority of my time researching skin and allergies and and nutrition. Um, but if you call me up and you're like, Oh, what about this broken leg? I'm going to be like, let me find somebody to help you <laughs> Like, go to this vet. First off, I'm not a vet, so you couldn't come to me for that, but you know what I mean? Find the right veterinarian, ask them, tell them this is important. I'm struggling with my dog's eyes. I want to know if that's your forte or if you would recommend someone else. So, okay. So we got inverted eyelashes. We've got the anatomy of your dog. Um, those are some causes, uh, allergies are some causes she's feeding more organic vegetables and only 8% of meat. She is following Dr. Richard Karen's. Yes, I know. I know. I know. You know, uh, I had a little conversation. This is going to take us a little bit off track, but I do think it's important. Um, I had a a little conversation with somebody yesterday, uh, that we discussed this very thing. And I, I said, you know, I support Dr. Karen. I, I, I just do. And I, and I love Dr. Roman. And I know that, um, it's hard sometimes for us to think, especially, but I remember a time when I thought Hill's science diet was the best thing. So I would just tell you, do not discredit either one of those veterinarians. They've been around a really, really long time. And sometimes you just keep moving forward, right? You just keep moving forward and forward. So please be open to their wonderful brains that they both have and be open to what they might be able to teach you. And you may not have to take all of what they say, but maybe you'll take a little bit of what they say. And who knows, you know, every dog is different. We always say that. Rita says, Rita Hogan says all the time. In fact, it's the name of her Facebook page. And if you're not following that, I would recommend it. It, Dogs are individuals. And so to say that we should rule out uh, now, now there is one thing I will say though, when it comes to that, be very, very careful about the commercial vegetarian diets that are on the market right now, because they are loaded. And when I say loaded, I mean, almost the entire diet is rice and potatoes. So be very, very careful, just like we're very, very careful, not feeding kibble and things like that to our animals, commercial diets, you need to really be careful. So I'm not going to harp too much into the vegetarian diet, but I do want you to be careful if you start looking into it for your pet. I don't know. I mean, animals are constantly evolving, although it does take a long time to evolve. Uh, So yeah, yeah, he has some stuff I recommend. Dr. Pickaren's book was the very first book I ever read. There is no way I would ever discredit him. He is, well, I shouldn't say no way. If he started, you know, pulling a Jeffrey Dahmer or something on me, I might. But uh, I'm not going to discredit him. He's a really smart man. He's a really, really smart man. So uh, get his book, read it, see if there's something out of it that that resonates with you that that might work for your animal. You know, don't be afraid to learn. Don't be afraid to learn. You don't have to. You don't have to agree with it, but don't be afraid to learn and educate yourself. So let's keep talking about some some tear stains. So. I always have to recap in my head because in my head, when I come on, I, I, I'm always like, okay, I got to make sure I cover all of these. So we've got uh, inverted eyelashes. We've got uh, the anatomy of your dog. 
make sure the anatomy of your dog, we've got uh, making sure there's a balance in your dog's body, right? You want to make sure that your dog is balanced between his bacteria and his yeast, because that way when he is tearing, he's not tearing out stuff that could be growing bacteria and yeast on his face. Uh, so you want to make sure you have that balance going on, uh, getting rid of allergies. Those are things, injuries to the eye can cause tear staining. Uh, but one of the things I really want to dive into and talk to you guys about is something that very few people talk about. And because you, you all hear it, right? We've all heard uh, change the water, change the food, change, do distilled water, don't do distilled water, do, you know, I don't know, bottled water. Like I've seen, I've heard so many of them and yet they still have tear stains. So I want to talk to you guys about something called uh, porphyrins. And basically, this is why some dogs who are on a raw diet can have tear staining. And one of those reasons is because the iron, right? It's like an, it's a rust color. It's a, we all, well, not all of us know, but uh, I think some of us know that that color, that rust color is iron. And so when your dog's iron levels are too high, that's why sometimes when you change the water, if the if your water has a lot of minerals and stuff in it that are kind of mixing together, that's why sometimes changing the water works and sometimes changing the food works. So if I always recommend to people, and one of the ways you'll know that it's because of possible too much iron is, remember in the beginning, I told you to look at your dog's, um, the, the color, I know this is weird. I don't know why I'm getting weird about this. I'm 54 years old for God's sake. Um, look around your dog's butt and see if the hair around his little anus is discolored. What color is it? Is it, and that's not from poop guys. It's not, it, poop does not leave behind, um, you know, kind of orangey stained color. Uh, also look around your female's vulva, look around your, um, male's penis and see if, uh, there's any type of discoloration there that looks kind of that orange stain color. Look for if your dog is, um, you could, you could, it's just expensive. So, and, and it, but it's definitely something to do. But the thing is, is that you can kind of alter it. That's why it's one of the reasons why I'm such a big believer and, and want people to rotate their diets because when you don't, you could be giving so much of something that your dog doesn't need. And he's having a hard, hard time getting it out. Dogs are individuals. Yes. They're so too much liver. Uh, it, well, liver is high in iron. So when we're giving liver treats and liver or like, you know, I obviously want us to have liver and organs and all of that kind of stuff. But if your dog is, so when there's too much iron in the body and it's having trouble passing and it's coming out in these little molecules, it's called porphyrins. Um, it comes out through the saliva, the tears, the, uh, urine, and it'll also come out through feces. And so when you see it other places, that is a huge indicator. Now, if your dog doesn't chew on himself, then you're not going to have orange stained paws. But if your dog's orange stained paws, then we've got, we've probably got too much iron. Uh, so you could go in, you could have a blood test run and check on iron. Although I will caution you, you'd have to ask one of the vets. I don't know if any of them were on here with this. Uh, yeah, so it's in the saliva. So you, so somebody said, what about the mouth? So the, if it's around the mouth, if you have staining around the mouth, it could be because of the teeth. So you want to make sure that there's no infection in the mouth. There's no, uh, cracked or broke teeth in there. Anything that's, if there's a lot of stuff in there, then that could cause bacteria to grow there. That's usually a browner color. Uh, but we're talking more about like that orange rust color. That's iron. That's too much iron in the body. Uh, but you have to know that there's to my, the best of my knowledge, and this may have changed in the last time I checked, there isn't a difference between how, like when you run blood tests, uh, a raw fed dog, how much iron a raw fed dog would show up as being normal versus a kibble fed dog. And I know that that doesn't seem like it should be the difference. Shouldn't it just be all dogs should have the right iron, but there is a difference because of how much is being absorbed by the body. So you do want to make sure that if you're having your iron levels test, you want to make sure that you have a, a veterinarian that understands that there could be a difference between your raw fed dog versus a kibble fed dog. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that you guys know about that just mild in one eye. 
Yeah, if it's if it's one eye, guys, it really makes me think it's a tear duct. So I just keep that in mind. Um, her mouth is fine. She's 11 months. I think we got that mixed up a little bit because where I was talking to, because somebody, Coco said, what about on the mouth too? Her mouth is fine. She's 11 months. Okay, I'm confused, Coco. Sorry. Um, okay, so if it's iron, then what are you going to do? Well, first off, I will tell you, I think probably some of the biggest problems with our animals are because we're overfeeding them. Just had this conversation with another vet the other day about pancreatitis. We were talking about what would cause black little splinters around the private area. Ooh, black little splinters. Uh, I, without seeing a picture, I couldn't tell you, but I'm thinking in my, is, if this, is this a female? Oh, no dental issues, just staining. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was like, I'm confused. Um, it depends on how much it is. Like, and sometimes like dogs have these like little folds right here. And so sometimes bacteria gets trapped in there and then it'll start to grow all along the mouth. Um, so I would say that if there, if that's what's happening, you've got a bacterial problem. If it's, if it's a darker brown, it's usually bacteria. If it's a, it's a, if it's a rust color, it's, usually from the poor friends and it's, it's iron. Um, if you're talking about the little splinter things down around the vulva for around his mouth is brown. My precious dog, my previous dog had some diet, didn't have this problem. Maybe there is a genetic component, not breed. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just tend to believe that anytime we have a bacterial issue going on is because the body's not balanced and we don't have the right, um, oh, he's male and it's around his penis. I'd have to see a picture. It, it's really hard. If you guys are on saving pets, well, I do it on the spa tip, but the spa page, we don't really do like Q and A's. Like we don't really write out stuff. And I do that on Millie's house. If you're not familiar with Millie's house, I have another page that I run called Millie's house. Um, but without seeing the picture, you know, I'm big on that. I pictures, I need to know so much about your dog before I feel confident enough giving you guys my, my personal experience and my advice on what will work. Uh, so without seeing a picture on the male penis splinter thing, I'm not really sure. Uh, feel free if you're on saving pets to leave a picture there and we can kind of respond there. Oh, bulldogs, my little baby bulldogs. Uh, if you know, you look at my little logo, you, that's a bulldog on there. I'm a huge bulldog person. So, uh, but I can't really comment on that one until I see. So, so what do we do? First off guys, um, get rid of, if you think that you might have an iron problem because your dog's staining around his feet, he's got staining around his penis. He's got staining, uh, around his little anus, all of that kind of thing. And you're th suspecting and you're feeding like a beef diet or you're giving a lot of liver treats. Try it for about two weeks. Now, remember, it won't make the stains go away. The stains, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you guys how to get rid of those stains. But remember, those are just super, the, those stains aren't superficial, but I want you to get rid of them, but I want you to solve the problem. I, I don't want them to come back. So it takes a while for that actual stain to go away. Um, so I would say give it a couple of weeks of changing the diet before you'll notice the new hairs coming in that aren't stained. So it does take a while. You can cut those off if you can. I don't know, depending on your breed or whatever's going on. Even on a bulldog, you could shave it off if it's driving you crazy and then watch to see if the new hairs are coming in. Uh, but you want to look at your dog's diet and make sure that your dog is not eating high iron. So beef, uh, liver, anything liver is, is high in iron. Um, you want to just make sure that the iron contents, and then you want to start rotating, but for a good couple weeks, you want to make sure you're feeding something that is lower in iron. So chicken, I know a lot of dogs, people think their dogs are allergic to chicken and maybe they are. I didn't, I didn't mean to say it like that, but, uh, do you, do you find a, a meat that is less in iron? And then also how often you're feeding. I know I'm a big supporter. I, I, I preach this a lot, but if you are just constantly putting food in your dog's mouth, you're not allowing their pancreas to have a rest. You're not allowing their liver to have a rest. You're just not allowing for the body to do what it needs to do. And you could be bombarding them. So just, I promise you, it is not cruel to feed your dog once a day. If your dog is a diabetic or has any medical problems that would require you to feed them more than once a day, hypoglycemia, any of those things, please disregard what I'm saying. But otherwise, try feeding your dog once a day and allow their system to just purge 
and get rid of all of the extra stuff that they don't need. Consider the amount of treats that you're giving them. I know people think they don't give their dogs or cats a lot of treats, but um, I once had a client a long time ago and she thought she didn't give her dog very many treats. And so she kept a jar next to her. I'm trying to remember how she did this. She put a jar next to it. Oh, that's what it was. Every time she gave the dog a treat, she also put one in the jar. And then she just got in the habit of doing that until she was like, oh my God, look at how many treats I gave my dog this day to, in, in one day. She Every time she went to the kitchen, he followed her and she felt bad. So she'd give him a treat. And so she realized, oh, so then what she did is that she created a treat jar and that's the only amount that she would give her dog. But be careful because the amount that you're feeding. Bye, D. Oh, good, good. They do. They do. They eat better. People, a lot of times, our own guilt, because nothing can guilt you more than a dog or cat staring at you, right? Our own guilt is forcing us to overfeed animals. And so now we have animals that are on these wonderful species-appropriate diets, but they're not following a species lifestyle, a species-appropriate lifestyle. And when you do that, what happens is you, you create illness, even with this wonderful food, right? So a species, an animal is, does not eat, they, they spend their whole day hunting and then they may catch one rabbit and then they eat that rabbit. So they get a lot of exercise. They burn a lot of fat. And then here we are going, okay, I need to feed a species appropriate diet, which is high in fat, high in protein, high in iron, high in all of these things. But our dogs got a little walk today and we went around the block, but then we saw the neighbor, Linda, and we started talking to Linda. So Linda and uh, Linda's dog kind of sniffed each other. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I have to get back and make dinner. And I know I'm making this whole scenario, but you know what I'm talking about? And then we think we took the dog for the walk and we didn't even really take the dog for a walk. We ran into the neighbor and we didn't get very far. So our dogs are not burning the amount of fat and protein that they would in the wild, but yet we want to feed them like a species appropriate diet. And we're not doing a very good job of feeding a species appropriate lifestyle, which is um, something I need to start talking more about. Are you feeding, maybe that's what we should talk about. Are you feeding your dog a species appropriate lifestyle? Um, that's what we need to do because we're creating situations in our animals that we're making them sick and we're causing all of these issues like um, too much vitamins and minerals where pancreatitis is skyrocketing. Uh, and so be careful guys and try to realize that the best kind of love is the tough love, right? The one where, where it's tough. And what that means, what I used to think tough love meant that you're just mean, but you're being tough on the person that you love. But the reality is tough love. It took me a long time to realize this out. Tough love is the hardest on us. That's why it's tough. It's tough on us, not tough on them. It's good for them and tough on us. So I don't know if you guys ever realized that or I'm. it just took me forever to figure that out myself. Uh, but I always thought tough love meant you were tough on them. And it's not. It's tough for us to love them so much that we take the the hard part and we take the burden on us of feeling bad in order to provide the most love we can to them. So try to think of it like that when you have decided to switch your dog over to a once a day feeding or, um, you know, at the very least, just give them less food in the morning and a, maybe a bigger meal at night or do something, guys, because your dogs can't tell you that, like, we could use iron as an example since we're talking about it. Um, if you if humans get too much iron, if you, I don't know if you've ever taken, um, iron supplements, they will constipate you, right? Well, you're, you, you might notice that about your dog, but what you wouldn't notice about your dog before he went to the bathroom is that his stomach hurts, right? So they can't tell us when they have too much vitamins or too little of a nutrient. They, they don't know. I know when I start to get worn down and I feel tired that my B vitamins are probably lacking and I need to figure out a diet that's going to increase my B, B vitamins. Uh, but our animals can't talk to us. So that's why rotating and fasting are so important, guys, because that way the body can handle itself and it kind of purges what it needs to and then we replenish and then it purges. And But we're never giving it that purging time. We're never allowing the liver to just 
help get everything out because we're just flooding it. And it's trying to put it. Why do you think all your dogs have these giant life, not all your dogs, but a lot of dogs have the lipomas. My dad's dog, who I am not responsible for, but makes me very upset. Actually, technically it's my dad's girlfriend was in today, giant lipoma on the side of her. And my heart is breaking and thank God that he doesn't watch this. Cause I'm calling him and his girlfriend out right now. Cause it, I'm, so sad that this giant lipoma is growing on this dog, but hopefully I'll, I'll get them to do something. So, um, and truthfully, uh, she's been trying lately, actually, she's been changing the diet and stuff. So it's never too late to change the diet, but it is hard to reverse some of the damage that is done when we don't start that. So walks, playing outdoors in the fresh air, massage and snuffle mat. I love them. My dogs get one carrot chip each a day for a treat. Awesome. See, we don't have to give them the whole cupboard. I should be telling my husband that because he gets up every morning and gives the cats treats. And I'm like, how many did you give them today? <laughs> Jesus. Um, but yes, making sure that we are allowing our animals to purge out any extra irons, any extra vitamin Ds, any vitamin D can be so dangerous, guys, which is why I'm not a big fan of supplements. And especially for those of you who follow on saving pets, one pet at a time, you know, that this was entire group was started by Kelly bone who um, has been on here before with me, but she's traveling a lot right now. And, um, but, and we have so many admins, but you know, that Kelly bones dog Duncan passed away from vitamin D overdose uh, from the Hills Hills, which is think about it, guys. If you think that you can be completely on board, you know exactly what you're doing. Hills is a lot. It's a, third, second or third largest manufacturing company in the world. And it happened that they overdosed all these dogs with vitamin D. So it, it's something that can happen very easily. So be careful. Supplementing can be very, very dangerous. So don't think you should just go down that road, but rotating, not just rotating, um, or not just fasting your dogs and feeding them. I'm a huge supporter of once a day, so long as we don't have diabetes or any other hypoglycemia or any issues like that. Um, but also rotating. So if you like, sometimes people, I see people do this where they get stuck on the fact that their dog can only eat beef, for example, and I'm using beef because it's high in iron. And you get this five strands test back and it tells you your dog's allergic to absolutely everything on the planet except for chicken. I'm going to give chicken a little call out there. So this scenario, the dog is only able to eat chicken, which is great. Chicken is um, a low allergen. And so we can put him on that, which would be awesome. But what if the only thing your dog could eat was beef? And so then what you did is you created this diet at home, which was beef, beef heart, beef liver, um, some bone. And then you started creating, you put in, uh, I don't know, some sardines and then you wanted to mess with your diet. So you, now you have the base, right? Have the base of beef heart, beef liver, uh, and muscle meat that's ground up beef. And then I added in some sardines, but then I want to do rotation. And so what do I start doing? Because my dog's only allergic to beef. Then you start adding in, uh, your veggies and you rotating your veggies, but you're not rotating your beef because he can only eat beef because that's what your five strands test told you. And so what's happening is your dog's eating an enormous amount of the same stuff over and over and over. And if we were going to have a, 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 a species appropriate lifestyle, that wouldn't happen in the wild. He wouldn't get the elk every day, every day I got, Oh man, I got lucky. I found a whole herd of elk and they're not real smart. So I just take one down every day. <laughs> That's not going to happen. He's going to have rabbit one day. He's going to have elk one day. And guess what? He's going to go days without food. So if he does have a big giant elk meal, he's going to be able to purge it a little bit. So I've been using farmer's dog lately, but only because it was gifted to me. I can't afford it. Um, it is very farmer's dog. Um, very, very, very expensive. And also an enormous amount of carbohydrate in it. And uh, I will tell you that, which is what bothers me. That is what bothers me about companies that are very, very, very expensive and using cheap carbohydrates. It, it's to me, it's, it's unethical. It, I, I get people need to make money. I, I get it. And no one else probably thinks it's unethical to me, but it is error that it's unethical because people are doing it, but it's unethical to me to take a product and load it full of 
cheap starch carbohydrates and sell it as if it's a nutrient dense food, but then you're putting in supplements to put back in the nutrients that should have been in the food in the first place. So I, it bothers me when companies do that. It's very expensive. And Crystal, I would tell you that you could absolutely 100% find a food much less expensive than that. That is way healthier for your four dogs. Um, and you've even heard me, I, I think people have heard me say, that might even mean that you do a little bit of kibble and a little bit of some fresh whole foods that you put in. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was super nice of whoever gifted it to you. Like that's like, it's such a, what a wonderful, what a wonderful gift, right? Because it came from such an amazing place, at, like a really awesome, I don't know who gifted it to you, but whoever, unless it was the company that gifted it to you, then that would be a little bit sneaky. But if it was a friend, what an amazing gift for someone to think about someone's four dogs and doing that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Uh, don't fast puppies. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Oh my gosh, thank you. See, sometimes I just get all crazy, which is why you want to be really careful about listening to absolutely listening when people are typing and stuff into Facebook because little tiny things like that miss. So we don't want to fast puppies or ki kittens, you cats, you don't want to fast at all. Um, they have some issues with fasting or kitties, but puppies, uh, we don't want to fast dogs until they're about a year old. And I say about a year old because a lot of dogs start, start self-fasting. Um, and what that means is if everything else is good and all of a sudden you've noticed that your dog is just not eating, your first instinct almost always is going to be, he doesn't like his food. He's kind of eating it in the morning. He'll eat a little bit at night, but he just doesn't really like his food. What he's most likely doing, if everything else is good, is he's starting to self fast, which means what you want to do is you want to realize when does he eat the most? Does he eat the most at night or does he eat the most in the morning? And we usually see this right around eight months, right around eight months. Um, so if your dog starts self fasting on his own, then you then you can go ahead and do that. But if he's not, if he's still gobbling up his food in the morning and gobbling up his food at night, then you want to make sure you feed a dog up until they're about a year. You can even go. 13, 14 months, depending on how much they're, they're going, so long as they're not overweight. Um, and then pick that time. So if you notice that he's not eating in the morning, then feed him his full meal at night and vice versa. But definitely thank you for bringing that. Don't fast um, any puppies unless, like I said, unless they're already starting that process of self-fasting. So um, their metabolism slows down. We don't realize it, but in one year, I have baby kittens right now who are going on two and a half months. And even they are starting to slow down. Like they were gobbling up their milk and even they're slowing down. So it happens really, really quick. I've just been adding a percentage of farmer's dog, not just that alone. I'll use it up and then change it out. Good. Cause you know, don't pay a bunch of money for carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are one of the worst things. It's not starchy carbohydrates, rice, potato. Um, speaking of rice, and as we were talking about nutrients, if you haven't heard me say this, I say this a lot. Um, in the group of carbohydrate, starch carbohydrate, if we look at all of the different types that are thrown in dog food, right? Like pea starches or potatoes or sweet potatoes or rice or brown rice and all of these things that are thrown in because they're cheap. Of, of them all, the worst one is rice. And the reason I say that is because rice is a binder which means that it has the, the ability to grab a hold of certain nutrients in the body um, and pull them out. So they can pull out all of, like stuff like uh, phosphorus, which can be really good if you have an animal with a, with a uh, kidney problem. It can help pull some phosphorus out of the diet. Uh, it can pull zinc, zinc out of the body, which if you have a dog who's itchy, you do not need a low zinc amount in your dog's body because zinc is so important. Uh, I, I don't like any rice, even quinoa. I, I just, if you're going to, if, if you're going to use that, then quinoa is going to be your best, of course. But I just am just, I try to stay away from it. It's really hard to find, um, something. And, and the thing is, is when you're looking at like, um, when you're looking at these commercial diets that are being sent to your house and they're using stuff like quinoa, not that this is what you're talking about, Crystal, but it just led me to this. Um, they're not using the chances of them using the highest quality, greatest organic stuff. What you're paying for with these companies is delivery. 
So all of your money is going to the convenience, not yours, but anybody else who's doing it is the convenience. Um, sweet potatoes, not a huge fan of. I just don't see the point of it. I just don't see the point of adding a sweet potato into a dog's diet when it is a carbohydrate. It is starch. It's on the lower side, but I just don't see the point of it. I think everything that goes in our pet's mouth, everything that goes in our pet's mouth should be have a benefit to it. It should provide something and not fight against something else. So if there's something in a sweet potato that you're looking for, let's say you're looking for vitamin A for whatever reason, you're looking for vitamin A, which sweet potatoes have, you can find it in something else that doesn't have a car that isn't a starch carbohydrate. Because the other problem with starch is, and when we're talking about tear staining, when we're talking about starch, uh, those kind of things will turn to yeast in the body. And then you can get that imbalance. Hey, Brian. Okay, guys, I knew I'd get one of you guys on here. So this is Brian, guys. Brian is one of the uh, moderators for Saving Pets One Pet at a Time. So he's on here with us. He might start te texting in and ha helping me answer questions. So uh, Brian is amazing. He has all sorts of uh, rescue dogs that he deals with. He works with a rescue and he also works for a raw dog food company. So a lot of times when we want to ask questions about how it's ground up, what it's done, how do you source, how do you freeze it, blah, 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 blah. like Brian knows all that stuff. Um, he's one of the 27 of us. So we're super excited to have you, Brian. Thanks for being here. It's really hard for us to get everybody on at the same time because what you also don't know over here at Saving Pets of One Pet at a Time is that there's 27 of us all over the country. So uh, we have people in the UK. We have people in Canada. So we're all over the place. And so the time zones make it really difficult for us to get everybody. Brian happens to be in Colorado, so it's not too, too bad for him. So, um, all right. So we're going to, let me look at these two questions and then I'm going to talk about what do you guys do once we figure out what the problem, what's causing the tear stains, right? And we talked about the iron. This is why it's so important to me and why I get frustrated when vets say um, it's no big deal. Can you imagine if your pet has a chronic too much iron in his body, what that could potentially lead to? Uh, we don't, we don't need that. We need to be purging and doing those kind of things. So keep close eye on that. Remember I told you, um, it's a good chance before I get into how we're going to get rid of these tear stains. It's a good chance that if it is other places, because it doesn't discriminate if it's from iron being too high, it's not just going to come out of the tears. It's it, you're going to see it where we're licking and chewing. You're going to see it around the rectum. You're going to see it around the, the penis and the vulva. Uh, and if it's a dark dog, it will look kind of like a, like just darker. It may not be red, but or orange, but pay close attention to it. So, okay. So now we're going to talk about what are we going to do about tear stains, right? We want to get rid of them because they're gross. And little Sally who lives next door keeps making comments. And we need to, Sally to stop talking about our dog's tear stains because it's embarrassing. Sally, Sally know it all, right? We all have one. You know, I've had actually had clients. <laughs> I had a client one time, long time ago. God bless her. She came and brought her dog to get her hair cut. And I'm sorry if anybody's name is Sally. I don't know why I said Sally, but. And I'll look at this. Is there another way to pull phosphorus out for a kidney disease dog? I tried just food for dogs, low protein kidney diet, and he had diarrhea for three weeks. Switched to solutions per kidney diet, and he seems to be doing well. Solutions is amazing. Those girls, uh, yeah. I, how, so how long have you been on solutions? I would stick with solutions um, and see what they've got going on and, and work with them and work with them. There's also another, there's another, uh, food, a company that makes a, uh, a kidney diet. You have to get a prescription for it. So it's a prescription diet and trust me, I'm not talking about Hills. Um, it's a prescription diet created by a holistic veterinarian and it's called Medicus and, uh, Medicus makes a whole fresh food diet that is for kidneys as well. But if you're on solutions, I would just keep going. I don't know how long you've been on, but but keep going. Have um, it tested and see see what happens there. Um, but if you sometimes, you know, sometimes diet, if you just get the right proteins and it might work well, I only recommend using the rice to pull phosphorus out of a, di a diet if you can't get it under control with the protein by lowering the protein. It's not the protein that you're lowering. Keep that in mind. It's the phosphorus. It's just that phosphorus is high in protein, certain proteins. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. 
Dr. Judy Morgan recommends them for older dogs. Um, liver, there's some, I, I don't know what Dr. Judy Morgan's um, reasoning is behind that. I do know that um, there is some research on potatoes for the liver. And so I suspect that's why she's recommending it. Like I said, I don't think it's the worst thing if it's sweet potatoes. I just think that depending on, you know, your dog and what your dog needs, needs for your dog. I just am not a big fan of adding carbohydrates, mostly because, you know, so many people do so much of it. If, if I could be guaranteed that everybody was just going to do a little bit of sweet potato and it wasn't going to be that much, and they were only going to feed their dog once a day, and they didn't have any yeast problems or be prone to yeast problems, like a bulldog, for example, English bulldogs, uh, number one dog to have chronic yeast problems is going to be the English bulldog. And the reason for that is because they're born through C-section most of the time. And so their gut bacteria are almost non-existent even as they come out of the womb. And so I would never, ever feed an uh, English bulldog any type of, um, yes, yeah, Solutions is amazing. I, keep going, Jenny. Just keep going. If everything say, seems fine with the kidneys and make sure that you retest, keep retesting um, just to make sure you're going in the right direction. So you should have some kidney values and then you want to retest and make sure. So one bite of yam in their dinners. What can I say? One bite of yam. Um, you know, like I said, it depends. Just know what can happen from a carbohydrate. So uh, sh carbohydrates turn to sugar in the body. Sugar feeds yeast. So if you're having a yeast problem, then you want to make sure that you're eliminating anything that can feed the yeast. It's hard enough to get rid of yeast without just giving a little bit of something that could be causing the problem. But if you don't have a yeast problem, your dog isn't prone to yeast problems. Um, a little bit here and there is not going to be the end of the world. I actually, you know, eat brownies every once in a while. It's not the end of the world. It's just the every day. It's the every day. I would consider doing sweet potatoes if it was every once in a while. You know, maybe you do a rotation for the week. Maybe during the week you give them sweet potatoes on Tuesdays and Thursdays and you don't give them sweet potatoes the rest of the time. Everything should be rotated. Uh, do you know a way to do it? No, I don't. But, um, I think really the body will do it on its own. You don't need to find, I'm, you can look up to see, I don't think that rice binds to iron. You'd have to look that up. I don't think it does. Um, it's only certain minerals that it, that it binds to, but I don't think you need to. I think if you're rotating and, up uh, and allowing the body to kind of do its own purge. So I would say, just make sure that you're going from beef to turkey to beef to chicken to, I don't know, maybe do a vegetarian day. We were just talking about Dr. Vicarian. Maybe, maybe you do a green juju day, right? Where you're not um, feeding any meat and the body will do it itself. The body will purge its iron on its own if you're not overloading it. So, all right, guys, we are going to talk about some fun stuff since I just mentioned green juju and I've got sitting right in front of me. I am going to talk to you guys about how... This is some goat's milk. Um, how, and I know what you're thinking. Oh, she's going to tell us to drink goat's milk. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you to drink goat's milk. Well, you could drink it. Your dogs can drink it. And of course, they think your dogs should drink it and your cats should drink it. But that's not what I'm going to tell you. So I remember the first time I met Billy Hookman, um, who I just adore in so many ways, but, um, I'm just putting this up cause I just want to make sure you guys see it. So, and then I'm going to put it down because mine is thawing out cause I'm going to give it to my kitties tonight. Um, but there are a lot of great, um, goat milks on the market and I'm not here to sell you. I do love Billy and I love green juju and all of these things, but that's not what I'm here for. The reason that I'm talking about this particular one is because it, it a lot of the, the goat's milks that are out there have other things in it like um, turmeric or cinnamon. And in a minute, you're going to understand why this is important if you're going to be using it for staining. Uh, but I want to make sure that like if you were to use this goat's milk, it doesn't have anything else in it. So it's just straight goat's milk. And that's important. It's raw, unpasteurized. It's important. But I remember the first time I met Billy, I told him this and he looked at, this was years ago. And he was like, really? <laughs> he was so like, really? And I'm all, yeah. He goes, I hadn't heard of that. So I want to tell you that this is not anything that green juju 100% supports. They have never, like, it's not on their label that you can do this. So this is my own little thing. So, uh, I've been doing it. I've done it on many, many dogs and I've watched it work, but it does take some commitment. So aside from making sure 
if we're just dealing with the imbalance in the body and we're, you know, making sure that we get rid of all of our carbs and our starches and all those kind of stuff, this is a, a way to get rid of the stains naturally. So you take your, you take your, uh, green juju goat's milk. Um, you could use any goat's milk, just make sure that it doesn't have, um, any, anything else in it. So I, I use green juju for staining because it doesn't have anything else in it. Um, and be careful because some of them have a little bit of turmeric and, you know, I don't know how your dog might react because what I want you to do is take this goat's milk and I want you to make sure you shake it up really, really well. And you're going to pour it in a bowl and then you're going to look for all of those little, it looks like bad milk. For those of you guys have fed goat's milk, you know, sometimes it looks like bad milk. So what you want to do is um, dip a cotton ball in it or whatever, a rag, I don't, it doesn't matter, and drench it all over the stains. Now, here's the greatest thing about goat. There's so many great things about goat's milk, but one of the greatest things is you can get that right in the eye. You do not have to worry. I actually had a client ask me to get rid of her dog's tear staining using peroxide. Oh my gosh. She read it online. Please be careful. This is why saving pets. We're so adamant. You know, lately we've been so adamant about not letting people uh, recommend other groups because we don't know what's being said out there. And we don't want to be, we don't want to be the, the catalyst for that. I don't like Kelly doesn't want to offer up this beautiful site and then somebody hears it on saving pets. And so they go to it and then they find out they're using peroxide and lemon juice to get rid of their dog's tear stains. That's why Rachel, one of our other admins came on and said, we're enough. We can't do this because there's just too many horrible ones out there. So what's so great about goat's milk is that you can get it right inside the eye. In fact, if your dog has an eye infection, I encourage you to put goat's milk in your dog's eye. Um, but you can get it all up in there and you want to saturate it. If it's around the mouth, you can do it around the mouth. If it's around the paws, all of that kind of stuff. And you put it in there. So if it is bacteria also growing in there, that's why this is going to work because this has got good bacteria in it. So you have to let it sit overnight, which I know is gross. And if you have other animals, they're going to lick your dog's face, which is fine because some will get left behind. Um, but you want to let it dry and sit there overnight. Let your dog sleep with it. You might have to put a cone on him so he doesn't rub on the carpet and get goat smoke all over your carpet. Um, but let your dog sleep on there. You should start to notice a difference in about two weeks. Um, it won't be completely gone in two weeks. And it's only if you are every single night. And then in the morning, all you're going to do is just to, if you're not, if it's fine with you to leave it there, like you don't smell it, it's not gross to you. If you, more power to you, because I would do that. If my dog had tear stains, I'd probably leave it on him constantly until it dry, dried. And then the next day you want to um, wash it off with some just clear water. Don't use anything else. Don't use anything that's going to kill the good bacteria that we just put there and then do it again bunch of goat's milk. It can get in the eye. Don't worry about it. And then also feed it to your dog too. Another goat. Yes. You have goats. Oh my gosh. If you have goats, you are so lucky because you could just take it straight out of the goat's teat. Is it called a teat on a goat? Somebody help me out. It is right. Is it? I don't, I don't know. I'm not a farm girl. I wish I was. I should be a farm girl, but I'm not. With the tear stain. Thank you so much for the info and the iron. Always learn so much. Yay. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, green juju milk. Shake well. Pour and bowl. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. She's putting it all there for you guys. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people don't realize. And it's super good for... Um, I use it for kittens when they have eye infections. I will dab some... Because, um, you know, I do uh, fostering for the animal shelter around here. So I have baby kittens. And sometimes when their eyes open up... Uh, if I get them right as their eyes are open, if I get them before, because my kitties go straight on to goat's milk and then they don't have eye problems. But if I get a kitten who's like one day away from, you know, and she's been eating someone else's powdered down milk or something, they'll open up with like little eye infections. And then I just squirt some goat's milk in there and then it just goes away naturally. They actually recommend that for humans, uh, not goat's milk, but the mother's milk. So if you have a baby, any of you mothers out there may know this. If you have a baby who has an eye infection, they have the mother put breast milk in their um, baby's eyes. It's very similar. That's the same similar idea with the goat's milk. So it's kind of cool to know that you can do so much with nature. Uh, so I hope that is helpful. I do want to point out. Yes, 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 yes. If you're, if you're, I do 
do want to point out one thing before I forget, which actually I just forgot. Is goat's milk beneficial if a dog has yeast imbalance? Yes, yes, because we're adding in more bacteria. So the more good bacteria you put in, then some of the yeast actually gets taken away. So absolutely do it. Um, if you, if you have a yeast imbalance, there's yeast, I should do a whole talk on yeast because I have a whole protocol for getting rid of yeast in your dog's body, but it, it is very difficult once you have an imbalance to get rid of it and balance it back up. It can be really difficult, uh, both in people. If you know any people that have had a yeast infection, they will tell you like it could be really hard if you have yeast overgrowth in your body. Um, but one thing I want to point out to you guys is there's a lot of stuff on the markets. This is one more thing I wanted to talk to you about. There's a lot of stuff out there on the market that is uh, sold to you to get rid of tear staining. I want you to be very, very, very careful because a lot of those are antibiotics. So you want to be really careful. Uh, uh, Billy won't even feed his dog dairy because of yeast. Billy from Green Juju, you're talking about cow's milk. <laughs> yes, a yeast talk. I know I, I I should. I'll do one. I'll do one next week, though. Uh, I already, I don't know, for those of you who follow us on Saving Pets, if you saw the post this morning about the woman whose dog um, might have a brain tumor and she's really concerned and she's not going to do chemo. And so next week, I really want to talk about, you know, the other options the other options because it's it's heartbreaking to me when when people and and some veterinarians uh, make people feel like you know you're a jerk if you don't do the chemo route and then you start to feel guilty and so next week we're going to talk about some of our options when our pets do have cancer but um uh, so yeah, definitely add that in but I wanted to talk about some of the products that are out there. A lot of them are don't work. I will tell you I I've seen them all and they don't work. Some of them are filled with some antibiotics in it. So you want to be really, really careful with that. Um, some of them are, you know, they say don't get into the eye. You can't get it in the eye. Don't use it because I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to get in your dog's eye. It, it's going to get in your dog's eye. So it's just crazy to me to make a product that is used for up around the eye of a dog who definitely isn't sitting still. They don't just sit there and go, oh, you missed a spot. Make sure you get right over here because I have a date tomorrow night and I want to make sure that, you know, my blemishes are all cleared up. They're not going to do that. They're going to move. And so it's going to get in the eye. So please don't use anything thinking you can get home and be extra super careful. Make sure you're not using any type of an antibiotic because you will then basically what you're doing is just constantly, constantly killing um, good bacteria. Billy from Green Juju won't feed his dog goat's milk. Yeah, I just, I, I, I don't, I, that's, I don't even know what to say to that, John. <laughs> uh, but I will see Billy very soon. So I will ask him, I have a hard time unless his dog is having some kind of his personal dog again, it may be due to his personal dog situation. I don't know. Um, but I, I find that. I don't know where, I, I don't know where you, did you hear him personally say that out of his mouth? Oh yeah. I'll ask him. Uh, I'll ask him what he, what he meant and where he was going with that. So that's interesting. So, but I will definitely talk to him. Billy is actually one of our speakers. He's going to be talking on a lot of um, interesting stuff. So at, at the pet X, the thriving pet expo that we're having, he's going to be one of our speakers. So I will ask him um, what he said about that. Definitely, I'm going to ask him, and then I will get you get back to you on that because I'm curious. Uh, I've seen goat's milk do such wonders; I can't imagine not feeding it to animals. I mean, literally, because of the amount of animals that I get to see and I get to watch grow, and I mean, generations I've taken care of so many animals at the spa. I, I've seen goat's milk do so much; I can't even imagine. So, sprouted brown rice and sprouted grains don't bind minerals. Yay. We recommend that for our human patients as well. Um, sprouted. Yeah. If you can find them and you can afford them. Um, but I would be really, really careful with rice as a starch though. Either way, it can cause an imbalance. Even if it's not binding to any minerals, it can cause an imbalance in the body. So I just never, ever, ever recommend rice to dogs. Um, so, uh, let's see. I believe he said his dog can't tolerate dairy. 
Yeah, I have to look and see. It could be an individual, an individual thing. It sounds like it is. Um, I can't imagine that Billy, Billy, Billy has some of the highest integrity from what, you know, over the years that I've known him, I can't imagine him working for a company that sells goat's milk and then not supporting the benefits of health milk, of health of, of it. So he must have something, some, I think he has a French bulldog. He used to have French bulldog. Um, and then he got a new dog and I think it's still a Frenchie and they have so many, so many health problems. So, um, all right, guys, make sure too that you're not using, um, that's what he said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, make sure that you're not using any antibacterial stuff on your dog's skin because your dog's skin has its own microbiome. Uh, so if you're trying to kill the bacteria with an antibacterial wipes, um, those kind of things, trying to kill that bacteria, kill that bacteria, um, colostrum, which is what I think you're meaning to say, um, is a good idea. Absolutely. Uh, that's basically what comes from the mother's milk. There's colostrum in that. That's why I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, I don't know who this is either. It says Facebook users. So I'm sorry about that. That's, I don't, my thing doesn't tell me. So, but I think colostrum is a really great way uh, to help balance everything. For the eye stain use. Yes, yes, yes. That's another good one. So uh, that's another thing that I do is I'll take the Nui gear. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll take the goat's milk and I'll get it all in there in the evening. And then in the morning, um, I'll tell my clients, I've had clients stay with me and I do this for them. I had a dog stay with me one time just so I could test. As for those of you who don't know, I test all of this stuff on um, clients who allow me to test their dogs. So I had a dog stay with me one time so that I could do the tear staining. So this was years, 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 years ago because I had the theory. And it always starts with my theory. And then I'm like, I need a dog to practice my theory on. Yeah, colostrum. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's great. Um, there's a lot of companies that that make it. It's straight from the mother's milk. And so you can get it in powder form too. But I think absolutely put that in there. Um, so anyway, I had her dog stay with me. And uh, one of the things you can do is just get that goat's milk in there all night long. And then the next morning, you can take the new gear lotion. Um, or if you want to wash it out, but the lotion stays on. So if you wanted to take the new gear, so new gear has a lot of enzymes in it as well. So you can wash it off with the new gear shampoo. And then what you can do is you can take the new gear lotion and then dab it on your face, your dog's face for the day. I don't know. I haven't tested it, but one of you guys could do it, it would be really cool. I don't know if the new gear shampoo and the new gear lotion would be enough to completely get rid of tear stains. Um, I've only used it in combination with the goat's milk. Uh, so someone else would have to try that to see if you could just constantly wipe out with the, the shampoo and constantly wipe out. It's something you have to do every day. So it's not something I always can do. I have to find clients that are willing to, to, to do it. And we're in a test, you know, like you're part of the study. You can't break it. You have to do it. That can be harder. So there have been a lot of times where I've had people keep their dogs with me for a couple of weeks and I detox them and I do all sorts of fun stuff. And then we do experiments. And um, so if you have one of those dogs and you're going to Hawaii for a couple of weeks, give me a call. Uh, I can only take small dogs, but if you ever had a dog that you wanted to do that with, give me a call. Um, all right, guys. I think that's all I have for tonight. Brian, I just want to make sure uh, you didn't say much, but I want to thank you, Brian, for coming on and being part of this and helping. And then for all of you guys that are on here, thank you so, so much for your information and your knowledge and sharing all of your stuff with us um, as well makes a big difference. Uh, it, we wouldn't be here, you know, talking to you guys without all your animals. The only thing I wish is that they weren't having any kind of medical problems. I actually wish we didn't have to have saving pets one pet at a time. Um, had Duncan not died from the overdose of vitamin D, we wouldn't be here. Uh, and then it's crazy when I got involved in this group, how many, I mean, I thought, I knew it was a lot because the spa, we have a lot of dogs that are struggling with different problems and skin and ear and Cushing's disease and pancreatitis and diabetes and cancers and all of these things. But then when I got involved in saving pets, I was just like, wow, it really is all over the country. It's every, it's all over the world. It's all over the world. So it's not a U.S. problem. It's a, it's a global problem. And uh, we need to drive the change that we need. 
And that's why uh, I'm hoping, I hope I get to meet some of you guys at Thriving Pet Expo because it's going to be like no other expo that you've ever been to. We are going to be doing some things at this expo that I guarantee you you've never seen before. And we're going to be working with some, uh, some actresses and uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of um, improvisational type theater to help uh, teach people how to communicate better to their vets. Because my goal is to grab a team of people together and kind of march out into the world and help our conventional veterinarians understand what we need and what our pets need. But we need you guys to do it. We can't, We most of the people on Saving Pets and even at, in, in the spa, and all over Facebook, we see so many people that are involved in the raw community and the holistic community. And it's great every time we get a new member, but each one of us, if each one of us, if each one of us could change the mind of one veterinarian, can you imagine? We wouldn't need these pages anymore. If we could help and change the mind, it, it would take years to get, cause we got to shift generationally. We need to shift our dogs back to health not our personal dogs, but our generations of dogs. But the, and if that's ever going to happen, then we have to change the minds of the conventional veterinarian so that they can see things just a little bit different. And so we need you guys to do that. So at the Thriving Pet Expo, if you're going to be there, I, I, I really want this team behind us. And so we're going to teach you guys how to change the minds of your veterinarians. That's our goal. Um, that's been my goal for a long time is if we can get one vet on our side, we, we can help thousands of pets. So um, I hope you guys will join me there. And But for now, I hope that I've helped you guys with your dog's tear stains. I hope you understand that they can be very serious. Uh, there could be serious problems with your dog's eyes. So make sure your vet rules out that the actual eyeball itself is okay. Um, and from there, you guys can start venturing out to try to figure out if you have some something else going on. Uh, you can have your dog's iron levels tested if you want and uh and kind of move around for there so if there aren't any other questions i am gonna let you guys go let me make sure i always have to go back through here oh brian i was educating myself on tear stains yeah i think you came in you might have to listen back because we were talking about one of the things that most people don't recognize is that sometimes their dog's iron levels can be too high um, which is why, you know, we talk a lot about on Saving Pets about uh, rotating our meats and our proteins as well as our veggies and everything so that we can make sure that we're not, we don't have too much of something or too little of something. And, and I think you came in right when I was talking about doing um, kind of fasting, uh, not feeding all the time so that we can give our dogs that chance. So, all right, guys, I will see you. Remember, I am on here every Wednesday night. Um, sometimes we have vets come on. Sometimes I'm trying to get Kelly back on here, but she's been traveling. But if you haven't had a chance to meet or talk or see to Kelly, she's such an amazing person. Um, but I do try to, I am on here every Wednesday night at five o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and I think in a couple of weeks, we have Dr. Canizero coming back on. I know that one of our vets in the background um, is, we do want to do a talk on spay and neuter, which we're working on some, uh, she really wants to be very um, study driven, science driven to kind of bring to you guys uh, all the information on spaying and neutering, because we did a post not too long ago about spaying and neutering and it became, it just got it gets really, really heated. It's a, it's a topic that can cause a, an enormous amount of stress on both sides, if you want to call it that, right? So you have the, the Bob Barkers of the world who are like, and if you don't know who Bob Barker is, then you're young. So congratulations. If you don't know who Bob Barker is, then you're young. So awesome for you. Um, but the Bob Barkers of the world who say, uh, remember to spay and neuter your animals. And then you have the other side who is saying, you know, be careful of when you spay and neuter your animals because it can cause some problems. And the sad part is, is that, and not to get too political, but it seems like we do that a lot in this country. It's this or that. And really, honestly, it's not these people over here are kind of a little like, no, it's not really this or that it's, we're kind of in the middle. So anyway, I just want to make sure that you guys know that topic's coming up. So you're going to want to look for that. Uh, we're going to, I, next week, I'm going to talk a lot about, um, 
you know, what do you do when you, when you don't want to do the chemo? And I, I hate to say don't want to, cause that sounds so I don't want to, when you've made a choice not to do chemotherapy because it feels right to you to do that for the love of your animal. Um, so it's important for you to, uh, I don't know what that comment is. I'm sorry. It says it's a, it, it has silica in it. I don't know where that is coming from. So anyway, um, sorry, I'm going to miss that one. But um, so those are a couple topics that are going to be coming up, spay and neutering. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, what to do when, you know, when you decide not to go the chemotherapy, that route. We're going to talk about that. So there's a couple more topics coming up. And if you guys ever have any topics, just shoot it out onto Saving Pets or you can send a message through the spa that just says, um, it helps the brain. Is someone telling me I need to, I probably need to help my brain because I'm constantly remembering to, or remembering to forget things. Yeah, that was smart. Uh, but if you guys have a topic that you want to talk about and you're like, Hey, I wish they would do a live on it. Kelly wanted me to start doing, well, Kelly wanted us to come on live and start doing more lives because we know so much gets missed in text. And so we thought, Oh, let's start doing more of these lives so that we can, um, Oh, I knew I had an appointment for micro bubbles tomorrow. I love doing some micro bubbles. That's my favorite because I get to see. It takes a while, just so you guys know, with micro bubbles. If you're if you're finding groomers, hopefully more and more groomers around are going to have these micro bubbles machines. But just remember, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight unless it's for dry skin, which I did a dog today that had. I should have. Why? Sock it before and after pictures. I get so busy. I just don't even think about it. I get him in the tub and I'm like, Ooh, what's the problem here? This dog only had dry skin. And I mean, was just beautiful after just beautiful, silky, soft, not a single white flake anywhere on, on his body. It was just gorgeous. And I just get really excited, but micro bubbles works for so many things. It works for, uh, just, uh, and so many things shedding, uh, Paw licking. I'm working with these two Shiba Inu Inus right now with paw licking and they're just doing amazing. Um, it allergens, just allergens alone. If you guys, I know I'm getting off topic because you brought up micro bubbles, which is like, oh, my favorite. Um, it's just amazing. So if you are having a dog with allergies and problems and issues, find a groomer with a micro bubbles machine. You won't, you won't regret it. All right, guys, I am going to let you go because I have to get back to work. Actually, I got to, I'm going to be at work till probably about 10 o'clock tonight. So I got to get back to work. I will see you next week. Uh, hopefully we'll have some more of our moderators. I want you guys to meet them. Uh, so I will see you guys next week. I just want to thank you all for being here and thank Lori. She is behind the scenes and she does all the typing. She types out everything. So all the information that you guys need is there. Um, it's pretty awesome because I can't, I'm, not a good multitasker in that way. So she, she does all that. So I want to thank Lori for that. And for the rest of you, I will see you later. Thank you so much guys. Take care. See you next week. Bye.